Okay, I'm I'm Bob Koontz, and I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm uh, from Colorado, and uh, grew up on a farm in eastern Colorado. And um, I was in the Navy for four years, and then I went to school here at Colorado State University. And I've been an, uh, a graphic designer and illustrator for most of my working career. I also taught for 35 years at Colorado State University in the art department. I taught design and illustration. In 1994, uh, I had a business and several people working for me, a design business. And uh, I sold that in 1994. And uh, for two reasons, I had a health problem a little bit and I thought maybe it would be a time for me to leave that work so I sold the business and then I started painting in 1994 and uh, trying my hand at being a fine artist. And uh, I also do some sculpting um, using, using mostly found materials. And uh, I work with rusted metal and old wood and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, but I started painting in 94 and uh, uh, when I was a designer, I, color probably was my strength as a designer, and um, color and design. And um, so I just uh, carried that over into my being a fine artist. And uh, so I was really, I have always been attracted to uh, the Favist style which Henri Matisse belonged to, uh, Kandinsky, uh, Andre Durain, there are several uh, really top flight artists from the past around the 1800s. And uh, I didn't adopt their style or carry their style, but from a color point of view, I think I did. I painted, uh, uh, using using really bright colors and it's just something that I like to do and so I've progressed over the years and it's uh, probably I think uh, my images are a little more sophisticated now and not quite so raw as they were in the beginning but uh, that's a little bit of my story Leah. Well, it's interesting, uh, again, growing up on a farm and I, I was not, a, and I was going to small little schools. I was never exposed to art through any of my schooling. And uh, other than, you know, doing Christmas and Halloween decorations and things like that for the windows in the classroom or the, or the board, um, you know, I enjoyed doing that, but I didn't have any more coaching than any of the other kids or anything. And, uh, but I, I, my dad was not an artist, but he could make things. And he was a sheet and metal worker after being a farmer and he could make anything out of metal. And I think that, that attracted me some. And, uh, and he, he could draw just a little bit. He could draw a horse's head or a donkey or a bird flying. And my brother and I both used to be really impressed watching him do that. And then we would try to imitate. And so, you know, like a lot of kids that go into art, I was typical in that I was drawing a lot on my notebooks and in the margins of my book when I should have been doing something else probably. But I never thought that I, at that time, I never once thought that I could become an artist I look back now and I see that there could have been certain influences perhaps but I never thought once that I could be an artist and I I went into the Navy after high school I was in the Navy for four years and uh, uh, I thought maybe and uh, I had to we all could apply for a school when we were in uh, basic training and I applied for drafting school. I thought, well, maybe that's something I could do. And, uh, but I didn't get the school. I, I was sent aboard ship 
right away, and uh, I became a clerk typist. It was called a yeoman, and uh, so that was my job. So uh, anyway, there was the Navy. This was 1956. The Navy drafted for a very short time, and two fellows came aboard ship that were three or four years older than me. I was senior to them because I'd been in longer, but uh, one fellow was, had gone to school at Virginia Polytech and uh, was a commercial artist. And so the other fellow had gone to Boston College and had a master's degree in English. Well, I became friends with both of those guys and they really influenced my going to school. But the one fellow, uh, the artist was, he was, during our downtime, he was sketching and drawing and he's in a notebook like I was doing. And, uh, but I had never seen at that point in my life, I had never seen anybody that could draw as well as him. And he was designing, he was drawing furniture sofas and tables and chairs and so forth lamps things like that and come to find out before the navy drafted him he was he was a married fellow and uh, he was working for a furniture design company in south carolina or north carolina the hardwood company country and uh so he was freelancing and he would send these drawings off and a while later, he'd get a check or something, you know, and I was really impressed with that. And one day, he, he, as we became friends, and I was always looking to see what he was doing, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, you seem to have a real interest in this stuff in drawing. He said, why don't you, when you get out of the Navy, why don't you go to school, go to art school? I didn't even know that I could do that. I didn't, I had no idea that I could go to art school. I must have not been paying attention in high school career day or something. Anyway, uh, so uh, that was my determination. I, I went to art school then after the Navy and uh, started here at Colorado State University in January of 1959. It was really difficult for me in the be beginning. Uh, a lot of the kids that I was in school with and competing with, all of them had come from, mostly had come from larger schools in the Denver area. They all had some kind of art background. They'd had art classes. I didn't have, had not had any of that. So, uh, so I felt really behind all these kids. I was, you know, it was catch up for me. And uh, the one strength that I had was that I was, learned how I was able to draw pretty well. And uh, so that kept me really going. And uh, by the time I graduated, I had a pretty good grasp on it. Um, and then I went to Denver and I worked in the Denver area for eight years, worked in advertising agencies, art studios, uh, you know, Rocky Mountain News newspaper and at the time. And uh, and got a lot of experience that way. In 1971 then, uh, the university, Colorado State University, uh, they were looking and they were hiring a, a new position to be art director and overseer or senior designer for the university communications. And uh, so I was sought out and I was hired. I took the job and I always sort of wanted to get back to a smaller town than living in Denver. And uh, I was married then. I had two children. And uh, so I took the job and uh, part of my role was to, to design a new identity for the university, a new logo. And then all of the applications of that logo to all of their print goods, all their vehicles, uh, signage and building signage and all everything and and they wanted a certain look I mean it, it, I developed the look but they wanted uh, a look for that because they had had nothing over the years and uh, so I did that and then the art department that I was hired to work in at University of Communications 
kept growing because of what I was doing pretty soon. I had like 17 people that I was responsible for. Um, and being, uh, not other, only other designers, but, uh, proofreaders, copywriters, typesetters, and so forth. And, um, about that time in 1974, then my superiors, uh, they were seeing the success that we were having and in, in our program. And, uh, my superiors then wanted me to move up, to move away from the board. In other words, to not be the designer anymore, to be the uh, just a, uh, an overseer. And I didn't want that. I still wanted to be the person on the board, to be doing the, the design and so forth. And while I had other designers working for me, I still was, you know, uh, was a senior there. Anyway, I decided to leave the university and I started freelancing just out of my home and I immediately got busy and so pretty soon I had to move into a, an office area and I hired one person, then I hired another and so forth. And it just sort of grew that way and uh, I called it Bob Coons Graphic Design Inc. And then I started another business, uh, a Photoshop photostat business and my work at that time uh, that was before the computer and uh, in order to prepare work for production for printing we had to use uh, what was called photostats a lot and uh, and typesetting and then we'd do a paste up of, of the work and get it ready for printing and I was in real need for that. And in our community in Fort Collins, uh, there was not a business like that. And I would, to get what I needed, to obtain what I needed, I would have to go to a printer in town. They could make it for me, but their business was doing printing. And so I'd have to wait sometimes a couple of days or more just to get a photostat or photostats, or I'd have to go to Denver to do that and drive down and back and it was costly and and uh, was not good time-wise so i bought a, a camera and started a photostat business and i called it that stat place inc and uh anyway that took off and i hired a person to run that for me and because while i was using it other designers that were starting to happen around town they were using the service and uh, businesses as they got to know about it. And uh, so I had two businesses going and pretty soon I was up to six people in the design business. And then pretty soon I was up to eight or nine. And I had the business for 20 years. It was successful thing, both businesses. And uh, so 94 is when I sold the design business. I kept the photostat business for another, I don't know, two or three or four years and eventually sold that. And, uh, and I had several people working in, in that for, in that business for me. And, uh, anyway, I, I sold these businesses in 94 or the design business in 94 and thought that, well, I always, I always looked at myself as being an artist first and not a graphic designer and not a, uh, an illustrator. I felt like I was both of those things, but I was an artist first. And I think that's a difference between some young people now going into the field of graphic design. They're going into the field to be graphic designers and they hardly think about the other side of themselves, uh, about just being an artist. And uh, so maybe that's a little bit of a difference but um, so I, I uh, took some art classes in uh, again at a, uh, an academy in a town near us. Uh, and it was Loveland, Colorado it was a little town and there, there was an art academy down there. And they would put on workshops. They would have reputable people in the field, painters and you know, pastel painters and so forth would come in and give a week-long workshop. 
well to help learn that side of the business, the fine art business. I took several workshops from reputable people and uh, and uh, painted and learned from some of the best. And uh, so then, you know, then I was doing my own work and then I started putting my work into art galleries and uh, the ones that would take me. I didn't have any problem doing that. So I was in galleries in uh, Jackson, Wyoming, uh, Oregon, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. And and the galleries started selling some of my work, not as much as I wanted, of course, but uh, wanted them too. But, but that was a good learning experience too. And I was entering different shows around and doing that sort of thing. But uh, in my styling, uh, early on, uh, I was doing a lot of a lot of Native American subjects at that time, and uh, until I got some criticism for that, why the criticism was why for me as a white man, why are you exploiting Native American culture? I didn't think that I was. I felt like I was honoring them. But anyway, it sort of moved me away from uh, doing Native Americans. Uh, I felt like I was doing them in a, a beautiful way. And uh, at that time, I, and I was doing a lot of horses. Uh, that's another image that I, I'm really fond of doing. Uh, a lot of other animals as well, but horses have always been primary. And... Uh, I had a horse as a boy growing up, and I always had a love for the animal and just their power and beauty and their being and and their spirit. And uh, so I I, uh, I was calling my work at that point. I was calling it, calling it Edge of the West. I thought it still has a nice ring to it, and I finally got away from it after I stopped doing the Native American subjects, and I just sort of moved away from that, calling my work that. And yet I still think it could be titled that because I'm from the West, certainly, and uh, I think my work is a little edgy. I want it to be. I want it to be different. I'm not a realist kind of painter. I can paint realistically. I could do that. It just doesn't excite me in doing it. And uh, so I like to explore design and color and uh, that sense and um, I've always always been that way even when I was working as a designer I was always trying for something new and different and and yet have a real quality and a long lasting uh, affect to it uh, if that's the right word but uh, anyway, uh, that's that's a little bit of my story. Just learning about that in art school and, and art history. And um, art history was really difficult for me in the beginning. And uh, it was something that I felt I you know, I had to take it to be able to graduate, uh, but it it was just something that I had to do at that point. I didn't really, I can't say I liked art history, but there were certain things, you know, when they were showing slides and work and so forth, there were certain things that certainly did appeal to me. But since I graduated, now I've become a, a believer in art history, and now I read and and study it more than I ever have. And in that, I, I found Fauvism, reading about it. And again, the people I mentioned, the most famous probably, Matisse and Andre Durain, Kandinsky, um, was a German artist uh, that was in that, uh, uh, Franz Mark was, uh, in uh, uh, the early Fauvism, it was an art movement, and it was like um, the uh, Impressionists. 
what the Impressionists faced at the time in the late 1800s. The shows that were, that were in Europe at the time were considered salon shows. Even in New York, when they were showing, it would be called a salon show. And they would be in galleries or rooms with high ceilings, and the work would be placed from four floor to ceiling on the walls. And if you were a preferred artist or a bigger name, then your, your work was at eye level. And so as you moved around the room, the lesser knowns were up high to the ceiling or on the floor. And uh, so there would be these new groups. And so the Impressionists being one, Monet and uh, that group, a lot of others, uh, you know, they were in the salon shows and, and that was the Impressionist work was seemed to be a big rage at that time. And then in the late 1800s or 1900, about that time, um, some of these other painters were painting in a Fauvist style, meaning, again, pretty raw color. And uh, they entered the show. Well, the Impressionists were uh, upset. Who are these people? How dare they to paint like this? And... Uh, and so one of the impressions, and I don't know who it was now, um, but one of the impressions gave them a term. He likened them to, he called them Favs, F-A-U-V-E-S, Favs or, or Favis, and that's how Favism came in. And Favs meant wild beast. And so that that's what their painting was likened to, like they were wild beasts painting in these raw colors. And uh, so they, they were not accepted in the early shows. They were kicked out of the shows. Well, those people just kept painting, kept doing it. Uh, the uh, German artist Franz Marc, uh, was born in, well, he was born in, in uh, 1880, and uh, he was making his mark, if you will, uh, in Germany, and then World War I came along, and he was drafted into the army, and at 36, he was killed on the battlefield in France, but at 36 years old, but his work he was known as a Favist, and Kandinsky, you know about his work, uh, was beautiful, and he was considered a Favist, and again, Matisse and Durain, and there are many others. And uh, uh, anyway, I, I just really took a liking to their work, and maybe some of it is because they were sort of mavericks they broke out they were doing something different and that they wanted to do and i think that's some part of me and why i do that now why am i not creating something totally new i haven't done that but i've likened back to their work and uh and doing it in my way Sometimes I think, oh my gosh, should I be toning this down a little bit? Should I be, I don't know, but it's after all this time now, it's become sort of just, this is my approach. It's the way I work. It's what I do. The uh, one that I showed you, the flower and the background, we just had 
some horrendous fires recently in near where I live in the mountains. And uh, shows there's a couple of people have started something they call it Ashes to Art. And they've asked artists to uh, do a piece that could be then uh, donated and auctioned off. And all of the monies that raise go to helping the fire departments. Um, anyway, we have entries now from every state in the country and one from England. And uh, they will have an auction at some point. And a brewery, a beer company in town has created a new ale uh, honoring this. And, uh, and they're calling it Ashes to Art on their label. And then all of the monies sold from that will go to helping the fire departments. Anyway, my painting that you just saw is large. It's 24 by 36. Now that doesn't really show my father's kind of work, I don't think, but maybe the color in the flower a little bit. Um, it's pretty direct and bright. But uh, I just did an abstract background over the canvas and the stipulation this year for the uh, show is that all of the artists participating, that we needed to use a remnant from the fire. And if you're a sculptor, you could use whatever you might find, a tree branch or whatever. And I had ideas along that line at first about doing a, a phoenix bird um, using branches and so forth. And I had a pretty much designed, but it was really difficult to work with because it was all just charcoal, burned pieces. And um, so then I finally hit on using charcoal, I, I used charcoal from the fire to do the drawing of the trees in the background of that image. And over the abstract painting that I did and, and the bright colors and so forth peeking through. And then, uh, and then I did the Columbine flower over the top. The Columbine flower is our state, Colorado state flower. And I thought it was appropriate. So I titled the piece Colorado Strong. And uh, I, I'm happy with it. I think it turned out pretty well. And uh, anyway, that's my um, contribution to the Ashes to Art project this year. And the other pieces are all going to galleries and uh, have been accepted in shows. Um, something with the bulls, were you able to see three bulls there as I was showing? didn't show all of them, yeah. but what I did a while back, something else that I'm trying is that uh, when I finish a painting, oftentimes, about all the time, I'll look at the painting a, a day or two later or whatever, and while I feel good about it, I always think, well, I wonder what that would look like if I had put red over here or blue over there and, and just paint it differently. Well, I finally thought, well, so I did a, a, this bold drawing a while back and I was real pleased with the drawing. And I thought, I'm just going to do that, which has been nagging me for a long time. So, so far I've painted six bulls. I have three others started. I'm doing different sizes and, uh, but I'm doing the same bull over and over, but with a different color and coloring and background and so forth. And so far, um, you know, it's probably more a project just for me and my satisfaction, but, but so far I'm pleased and uh, with the results. And, uh, but again, there the sense, the, the color really comes through in all of these images, I think, and how I work. And um, so it's fun project and I might uh, do this with more subjects, just take one drawing work work a drawing out where I'm really satisfied with the drawing and then paint that over and over. And, uh, and the sizes range from 12 by 12, the smallest, all the way up. I'm working on one now on easel downstairs of 36 by 36, 40 by 40, and a 48 by 48. And so I plan even to do a 60 by 60. 
And what I'm finding as I go larger, then in the areas that I'm painting in, uh, I have more freedom, it seems like. That's what I'm learning. And uh, I can paint with a different kind of brush stroke than I did, than I would do, say, on a 12 by 12. I mean, it just makes sense. I can't use I can't use a one and a half inch wide brush on a twelve by twelve painting as well as I could use that one and a half inch on a forty eight by forty eight. So I'm learning a lot about that, and uh, but studying uh, other artists is also uh, something I do often. I see the work as as work pops up on Facebook or whatever, uh, I save a lot of that work and just to be able to study and study that artist and how they painted it. And so I'm always looking, studying and learning that way and always teaching myself new things. And uh, it's been uh, exciting and fun journey for me in my career as an artist. Uh, I do uh, once in a while. I don't do that a lot. I have the same with uh, pet portraits. I do that from time to time. I'm commissioned to do a, somebody's pet, dog or cat. And, uh, and I do that, but I have to do it. I tell them I have to do it in my style. And um, so, so I don't do a lot of that. Um, but uh, but I enjoy it. I do enjoy it. And uh, but that's sort of secondary. That part of, my, of what I do is sort of secondary to my other side, I guess. And I also it seems like this stage in my life and as an artist, I just. I just paint whatever I want to and I just paint sort of at the spur of the moment. I'm always coming up with some funny thing, a different way to look at things. Um, you know, for example, I, and I do uh, bugs and, you know, insects, beetles and grasshoppers and frogs and butterflies and things like that. Uh, again, it's just an interest. And uh, I can't tell you how, you know, in doing some of these things, and then I, I of course, I research it and, and uh, you know, like beetles, for example, I found another like 40,000 species of, or 400, I don't know, 300,000 species of beetles or something like that. I mean, it's outrageous. 40,000 species of frogs around the world. Well, my gosh. And looking at some of these things, I mean, they're beautiful grasshoppers. And uh, so I've painted some grasshoppers and now I'm, I'm doing, a, I have a grasshopper drawing. I'm sorry, I don't have it right here to show you. Turned out really well, the drawing. I haven't painted it yet, but I've got a cowboy sitting on a grasshopper with a lariat, with a rope. Now why? I mean, I don't know. Just something that intrigues me. I want to see how it looked, I guess. And it'll be done with the bright colors that I that I use, and 
I like uh, really trying to do something different in the backgrounds. And uh, uh, that al always intrigues me. I try to, uh, in my mind, I try to, uh, about all my work is uh, imagination work. It's not, I don't work from subjects necessarily. I don't sit down. I don't put up a, I don't do many still lives. I don't do setups. I can. And I keep threatening to do more of that, but then try to push it into my direction. I think, as I'm thinking about it right now, I think probably one reason that I do it that way is uh, if I do a setup or if I do plain air painting, if I go out and paint or if I'm doing a, a portrait and somebody's sitting in front of me, my problem is I try to make it look exactly like them. I, like, I try to paint it exactly what I'm seeing. And for me, that is not a strength. That is, I don't like doing that because uh, what I find is that it, it inhibits me because all of a sudden then I'm, I'm trying to make this tight, realistic looking piece. And while I can do that, uh, it, there's some of the fun taken away from me. So I, I prefer to paint from the imagination or draw from the imagination. I'll look at, I'll look at things, but most like this bull that I was showing you, that's drawn from about four different bulls. And I put them together and to make one. Uh, the same with most things that I do. I, I'm doing a painting of two butterflies right now. Not the same species of butterfly on the same page. There are two different ones sort of competing for a, a resting spot on a flower. And, uh, but each butterfly will be painted differently. I, I put in a really nice background first. And now I'm doing the butterflies and it's coming out really nicely, but each butterfly will be very different and won't be anything like you would see. It's all made up. And, but I prefer doing it that way. And yet at the same time, making it believable that it could be a real butterfly. And uh, so that's sort of a little different twist, I think, for my work and how I approach things. And uh, for me, it's, it's uh, exploring and being innovative and being creative, I think. And I give credit to the creativity part, going back to my years as a designer illustrator, because there I was always having to solve somebody's visual problem about something, whether it was a logo, an ad, or a brochure, or a catalog, or signage or whatever package design I used to do a lot of package designing so my goal when I was a designer and in my business was not just to satisfy the customer I mean, yes I had to do that but not just to satisfy the customer but to satisfy myself in what I did so uh so that was my uh, approach. And, and I still have that same thinking when I approach a painting. I always know what I'm going to do. And I sit down, I do sketches, thumbnails, whatever you might call it. Uh, something that's easy for me to read later. And I'll do several pages of, of these kind of things, just small ideas. And then... I go to the canvas and I draw it up bigger and, and go from there. At the same time, as I'm doing the thumbnails, I'm also thinking about color, the color approach. What should the background be? What time of day? You know, I, I try to think about those kinds of things and, uh, and yet give it a distinct, different kind of look and feel. And that's sort of been my goal ever since I've been an artist and 
that help? But a company in Germany contacted me about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and uh, to see that they found some images that they liked and to see if I would be interested in, in their making puzzles out of some of my work. So that's a nice relationship. And so far they've printed four puzzles, I think, and they have one in the works. It should be, could be coming out any time. The COVID has sort of held up production a little bit on it, but it, it's uh, of a wolf. And uh, so far they've printed, I've done a, a cat, a rabbit, Jack Rabbit and um, let's see, a lion and one other, I think. Anyway, I, I have four puzzles out, and they they offered the puzzles then uh, through Amazon, and there might be a couple of other distributors in the country that where you could buy the puzzles. I think there is a company out of New York, but Amazon has them, and uh, and then they sell them around the world they sell them in Europe and, and Asia now and and they're doing pretty well with it. I, I'm real pleased I'm real happy and to have been uh, picked up by them I had a company in uh, a magazine in Russia about three years ago contacted me and they did a, uh, a major feature article on my work and uh, a publication in Russia, a nice magazine. And it was really uh, the magazine devoted to horses. And uh, and so they again used some of my, my images, not just totally horses in the, in the article, but that was nice to have happen uh, for me. And they just found me, I don't know how they found me. I have a Japanese company a calendar it's a printing company and they produce a calendar that they give to their clients each year and uh, they've been in contact with me they found me some way and they are interested in uh, so I have sent them work I don't know if they're going to produce any of my work or not but they could and to be made into a calendar a Japanese printers are some of the best in the world and the printed printed piece is some of the best in the world <clears throat> so i'm excited about the potential of that anyway that i could have a calendar coming out of japan you know i do again i do I just do small things. I've never done anything really big, but uh, uh, I'd like to take a welding class and then maybe do something, start working larger. But at this stage in my life, I probably won't do that. But I work with small things and I, I do a lot of uh, boats, beetles, insects, um, horses, uh, deer, elk. Uh, buffalo, things like that. But it's all from found materials. I'll find it. Uh, I did a, uh, a mag, we call them magpies here. It's a black and white bird. They're a beautiful bird. They're sort of a nuisance bird, bird considered, but I think they're beautiful. And, uh, and so I was, for example, I was fishing one year. I'm a fly fisherman. I was fishing one year up uh, near on a river near us and uh, I went by a campfire and a, and there was a piece of wood that had been in the water and then had been in the campfire it was slightly burned and then probably back in the water and it was it just I picked it up and I had that piece for 25 years before I did anything with it and I made it into a magpie and it is one of the best pieces that I've ever done, I think. And I just used what was pretty much given to me. And I didn't have to do much shaping or anything and mounted 
on my little pedestal and it worked out really well. But I, you know, I do a, I did a praying mantis it was about three feet long and uh, two feet tall or something and all out of old wood and rusted metal and rivets and things like that. And uh, I just did a, a bug recently that you can hang on the wall and, um, but yet I make them in a way that, I mean, it's a piece of art, you know, it's nice to look at. And, uh, and so I, I like doing that sort of thing, just putting things together. And uh, uh, I did a, a mosquito that's, you know, looking down on it, it would be uh, probably cover almost 12 inches round looking down on it with the legs extended and it stands up probably six seven inches off the table and uh again i just made it out of junk but it turned out really really nice and uh, uh that piece is a favorite piece and i i will never sell it um a lot of the work that i have i i sell in art shows and uh so, you know, I go, I just go back and forth with sculpting and uh, with my art and my garage is a mess because that's where I, my sort of my workshop is for the sculpting stuff. And I keep collecting junk and <laughs> my, my wife said to me, what are, you know, is there any reason we're keeping all this stuff? And I said, well, eventually I want to get around to making something, but, um, so I've just always, uh, and I remember back when I was a kid, I was carving. I did a lot of carving just with a pocket knife. I remember making, carving a boat and just different little figures. So I was fiddling around with stuff then uh, and never and never thinking about it in an art kind of sense or anything, just something I like to do. And, uh, but that certainly has carried over into my life now. And uh, I made a Viking uh, that I'll shoot a picture of that. And so you can see, and, and the shield that the Viking is holding is made out of an old uh, Coors beer can. And, uh, but it just, again, just junk stuff. And, uh, and just an interest. I always would have liked to have taken this stuff really large, making it bigger than life size even. And there are some artists doing that and I feel I missed my calling a little bit uh, that I haven't done larger monumental kinds of things. But, but now that would take a big workshop than I have and tools that I don't, have that I don't really need now at this stage of my life. So that's just a little more about me. Gosh, I don't know that I have really any achievements that I can talk about other than I think I was liked by the students. Um, you know, there's always going to be some that don't like you, but uh, I think, but I was pretty favored as, as a teacher and I loved teaching, loved it and still do today. I don't now other than with my grandkids and, and uh, coaching them and, and uh, one son and uh, I love that. And so I did it for a lot of years. I was never, uh, I was not a professor. I wasn't hired full time. I did it as I was, my contract read affiliate faculty. I think now those people, uh, their contracts, I think they're, they're called adjunct teachers and, uh, or adjunct faculty but mine was affiliate faculty. I don't know if there was any difference or not. And so um, 
the class was designed and the illustration. And we would give them the class projects to do, made up projects, of course. If we could find a real project from a business in town that we could work on, we would do that. And But it was always uh, fun for me. I usually had about 20 to 25 people in the class, class size, and uh, an equal mix of guys and girls. Um, something that I observed and just interest is as an aside, uh, I'm left-handed and I would take an unofficial poll at every class that I taught. I mean, I never talked about it, never said anything to anybody about it, but I would just observe that uh, in the common population, I think worldwide, about 10% of people are left-handed. But I think in the art world, more people are left-handed. And I think we, uh, art people tend to use a different side of our brain. And anyway, I would observe every class that I taught, 25 to 30%, and once in a while even higher, of the students, every class would be left-handed. And that's just something I will, I don't know why I'm talking about now even, I just sort of kept to myself, but it was something I did observe. And, uh, and I just found that interesting. Um, but as far as achievements in class, I, I don't know. Um, I, I guess the achievement was by how well some of them did after they graduated. And some have gone on to do some pretty spectacular things, I think, in the, in the design world. And I hear from them uh, quite often, different ones. I had a student, uh, uh, Devin Morgan, uh, she went to school here and graduated uh, several years ago. Could be almost getting to be 20 years ago now, I don't know. And she's in Asheville, North Carolina, has a thriving graphic design studio and uh, she's doing very well and a, a girl in San Diego, a girl in California, a guy in, in Los Angeles and I mean it, it's just on and on and so that feels good to me that maybe I had some positive influence in their uh, creative lives and their learning years. They're all learning years. But um, anyway, I, I think I've been some influence, positive in that regard. Well, I'm working on, I've got eight paintings going. That's something I like to do. Um, I always have more than one going at one time. And my reason for that is that sometimes I can be painting and all of a sudden, I don't know what decision to make for my next step in, a, in color sense, say. I don't know what I want to do or I reach a point where I, I just, I'm, I'm lost for a moment. So what I do, if I, since I, and it's just the way I work, but I've worked that way as a designer too. And so it's a carryover. But I would uh, just move, I'll just move to another painting and work on that painting. And then, or maybe work on two or three others. And then, then I go back to the one that had stopped me for a moment. And the answer is there. Now, how does that work? I, you know, and I'm asking the question. I don't know how that works in our, in our heads, in our minds. But all of a sudden, the answer is there. Uh, the same when I go to bed at night. If I'm struggling with a piece and I don't, I can't find the solution that I want at that moment. A lot of times, I go to bed thinking about that, and in the morning, in the shower, the answer is there. 
why is that and how is that? I, I, I just don't know. But it works for me. And so right now I've got the grasshopper that I described going. That's a large piece. It's a 24 by 30. And uh, I've got three bulls that I'm painting on. And I've got uh, a fish, about a 12 by 12 fish, just made up fish and uh, real colorful. And, and a horse, again, it's about half painted and uh, it's just really, really colorful. And I'm trying a little different, something different on it than any horse that I've done before. And that's the other side of me is that I like doing that rather than finding, finding one thing that I feel then ends up being successful. I don't always go back and try to repeat that same technique on another piece I, I change it up and uh always exploring it's you know you said i can see that maybe people uh if they were to walk in a room of my paintings and look around they would see one artist for me i see as a lot of different pieces but anyway i'm working on a fish and this horse i've got uh a lady Godiva, a naked lady on a horse that I'm doing. I've got a some kind of a a goddess that I'm working on with wings, and and uh, oh my gosh, I'm kind of not even thinking. Um, but anyway, I've got like eight paintings going all at the same time, and they're all in different stages of production. And, uh, but that's just, that's the way I work. I'm in, in a show coming up. I'm in a show with eight women. There was a guy in the group and he dropped out, but there are nine of us. And I love the title of this group. We're getting ready for a show in Loveland, a town about 15 miles away. And we call ourselves driven to abstraction and uh, so about all of the painters seven of the painters in the group are all strictly abstract non-objective kind of painters I do some of that work sometimes I just paint it just ends up being color and shapes uh, I do that more as an exercise I think than uh, to make really finished work although i do finish them and they say they are standalone paintings but uh in my mind they're more uh step work for me more of a learning process and but anyway i love the title of the group driven to at driven to abstraction and uh, that's fun and so we're, i'm getting ready for that show each of us will have four pieces in the show and uh and so again getting ready for that that'll open on may 15th i think in Lovin, and we'll be up for a couple of months and uh as much as we are allowed to do an opening i don't know how all that's going to work out yet with the gallery but that's sort of fun i'm in a show in Greeley, that's another town about 35 miles from here. And they have a, a huge rodeo and they call it the Greeley Stampede. And it's a big, it's a big thing. It's sort of like Cheyenne Frontier Days or the Denver National Western or the uh, big Dallas National Western. Uh, so it competes with those, those kinds of shows, not compete directly, but I mean, it's of that stature. They, all, they have an art show component and I and it's invited show only. And I've been in the show for the last five years. And um, so I'm getting ready again for this year. And I think some of my bull subjects might uh, work well in the show this year. Each of us can have about six pieces in the show hanging and the show will be up for the duration of the rodeo, which is about 11 days. And uh, I enter shows around the country 
from time to time and um, in the world. In fact, I still do some poster designing. Um, not as much as I used to when I was in the field and in design, I did a lot of uh, poster design work that I entered in international shows and uh, in Japan, China, Russia, Germany, France, England, I'm just all over Scandinavian countries. And uh, so that, that was fun to do over all those years. And again, I'm, I'm trying to get back to doing that more. And I just got called for entry from uh, an international show coming up. And it's about space. Anyway, that'll, that'll be fun to do. So. Well, I'll tell you about uh, Pablo Picasso. I was in Barcelona a few years ago and spent a lot of time in, in, his, in the museum for him there. That guy, now he, I would say, is talented. Talent, he was talented beyond anything. He was able to draw. He did a, a drawing when he was 13, a painting when he was 13 years old. That is beyond. There's, I mean, he couldn't, if he had painted that way, to, and he did a, a painting of a bullfighter uh, he, uh, when he was 15. I mean, it goes on and on like that. And he did a painting of his mother on her deathbed. He was 16 years old. It's a massive painting, and you, you wouldn't want it in your living room, but she was on her deathbed. His father is in the room. And the doctor's in the room, and Picasso's at the foot of the bed. It's one of the technique-wise, drawing-wise, and just how it's painted. It's beautiful, but it's only it can only be in a museum. But he did that at 16 years old. So if he had spent the rest of his life painting like that, uh, you know, where would where where could he possibly have gone with his art? So I see why he, artists I think always like to try something new and different, and they want and that's what changed him or drew him into the direction of the abstract work that he ended up doing. And but now I would consider him talented because he was able to do fantastic things when at such a young age. He did a drawing, a Conte crayon drawing of a man's back from the shoulders, say, to the waist. Red Conte crayon that was as masterful as anything that I have ever seen. And he did it at six years old. Now, nobody can do that at six. Not like that. But he did. Now, so in his case, I would say he's talented and there are others that I could name too, that are very, 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 I would consider talented. But for myself, no, I don't think I'm very talented. I have an interest and I have a desire and I have a like, maybe that all counts as talent. I, I'm of the belief too, <laughs> now this is a big statement, but I'm of the belief that I could teach anybody to learn to draw and to paint and the, the kicker in that is that they would have they would have to agree to commit. And I really believe if I can teach I could teach anybody. Now that's a big statement I realize, but but that's my belief system. <laughs> I would I would like to extend to all the people viewing this uh, to go back look at Favis art Favism again I'll spell it F A U V I S M and look, look at some of those artists uh, the uh, 
I'm going to jump to another uh, movement, art movement. Secessionist art was started in Vienna in about the same time period of, as Favist art. And uh, Egon Schiele and Gustav Klimt were part of that movement, part of the secessionist. But in my mind, the secessionist art, a lot of it in coloration and so forth, related to the to Favism, to Favist art. And uh, in some instances, I can't tell the difference. And for me, it's all uh, Favism. But if you think about the color, for example, that Gustav Klimt painted with and the styling, uh, I think his, I think his work bordered on Favism too, but, uh, but do look up Favism. I think it's, uh, fascinating and to study the history of it and to study that movement at the time. And in my little way, I guess I'm still trying to extend that or carry that on somewhat and, uh, but again, I, I would like to extend that invitation to people just to check it out, explore it. It's interesting, really interesting.